Bonum Mane. That was Latin. <laughs> Bonum Mane. Welcome back from a week out in the world of darkness. Glad to see everybody still here. I'm sure we'll talk all sorts of things this morning. I'm sorry? Oh, thank you. Yes. <laughs> all right. We're going to keep going in the book of Revelation, chapter 3. Continue studying the letter to the church at Sardis. So I'll invite you to follow along, Revelation chapter 3. And as you're finding your way there, I'll open us in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for bringing us here together once again. Thank you, God, every time uh, that we're able to meet, to encourage one, one another, to study your word, get to know you better. Uh, there's no greater joy than that, Lord. I'm so thankful that you've given us your holy word something we can rely on, something that is absolutely true, that stands the test of time, and we can find peace and solace in it. Thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit that is con constantly uh, witnessing and encouraging, reminding us that we are in Christ, those that have trusted you, and uh, giving us the strength to endure all things. I thank you, Lord, for uh, this opportunity to understand what is going to be happening after the body of Christ is taken up to heaven and what life will be like, at least to some extent, on the earth as you pour out your wrath. Lord, as we look around the world today, it sure seems like we're very close to that point. And I am so thankful you will not wait a second longer than necessary and at the same time give as much time as possible for all to be saved and to know who you are. So thank you, Lord, for being so loving and for everything that you are and may all honor and glory be yours in Christ's name amen okay Revelation chapter 3 let's read through the letter to the church at Sardis and go over what we talked about last week it says unto the angel of the church in Sardis write these things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and art dead. Be watchful, and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received, and heard, and hold fast, and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So far, we have gotten through the first three verses a little bit more in depth. The first verse, again, alluding to God, his deity. Uh, when we read that he has the seven spirits of God, that should remind us of Revelation 1-4, how the seven spirits are before the throne of God the Father. And uh, this, we know Jesus is talking, and he's saying this is what he that has the seven stars uh, seven spirits of God and the seven stars. And at the end of Revelation 1, when he explained what the seven stars and golden candlesticks are, the seven stars are the angels to the seven churches. Now, it's because that these are lumped together in the same verse. I've heard it said that the seven angels that stand before God's throne could very well be the seven messengers or the seven angels that he's talking about. Okay, sure. I'm a lot more interested in what they have to say uh, then identifying are these the seven spirits right before God's throne or seven other angels because there are legions and thousands and thousands of angels. Okay, so I'm not going to get into sorry, <laughs> any uh, dis, uh, debate about that. Something to think about. But we know that Jesus is God. Okay? I know there is a particular Bible translations that, translation that tries to prove he's not God. And even because of that, or despite that, 
that same translation still proves that Jesus is God. There are many verses that say that Jesus is God. So there's no way around it. God says that Jesus is God. Jesus himself claims he is God in his earthly ministry. Jesus is God. And here he comes saying to this church in Sardis, I know your works, in verse 1. You've got a name for yourself that you're alive, but you're dead. Okay? So we started looking at what does that mean and went through several different passages, 2 Timothy 3 and 4, for example, how in the last days perilous times shall come, men shall be co covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient parents, that whole list which it's like you look around the world today and say, yep, yeah. uh, nothing's missing from that list. Uh, but at the end of all of that, it says having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And that's the point of going to that verse. Sardis is a church like that. They are basically a church in name only. They uh, are exuding the idea that they are spiritual. Perhaps they are spiritual. They're religious. You know, the world looks at them in some ways, say there's a bunch of do-gooders there, we like them, or whatever the case may be, but they're not doing the works right. Spiritually, they are dead inside. And we went to Matthew 15 and 23, passages that say something like, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And uh, Matthew 23, that's the whole... Uh, woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, over and over and over and over again. Uh, and some of those are, you are like whited sepulchers or whitewashed tombs, because I don't know many people that use the term sepulcher these days. Uh, but they're like graves painted to look pretty. They look nice, but inside, just dead, right? And that's the idea of this church here in Sardis. So right away, we notice uh, that there is no condom... <laughs> commendation there is kind of a condemnation there's no commendation to this church right away it's, I, I know your works they you say you're alive but you're dead and so when we get to verse 2 where it says be watchful strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die they're sort of doing something right so somewhere in the mix, midst of all these selfish works they're doing something selflessly or something according to the word of God and but those things are ready to die a, a, to give way to the walking like the world. So Jesus is telling them, be watchful and strengthen those things. That's what you need is the, the walk to match the talk. <laughs> uh, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. So between those two things, uh, the two verses, I mean, when he says, I know your works, and at the end of two, your works are not perfect that helps us to understand what he means by be watchful and strengthen the things which remain. He's talking about works. Hey, does that make sense before I move on? Okay. And then we got through verse 3 to some extent where he says, Remember therefore how thou, thou hast received and heard, hold fast, repent. Hey, all of these are commands, uh, but different tenses, and I went over that before. But what have they received and heard? They had received the word of God. They had received the gospel of the kingdom. Uh, they, they knew all of that stuff. So they've received it. They've heard it. And now he's saying, hold fast. Because they have just a tiny little bit of them that's doing what's right. Uh, and he wants them to repent of all that other worldly stuff. Like, don't just have a name for yourself. Live it out. Okay? Uh, and the, the warning there is if therefore thou shalt not watch, so if you don't pay attention, if you don't have a sober mind like God says elsewhere, then I will come on thee as a thief. If you don't pay attention to what's going on, because God says, here's what's going to happen, and as we get through the book of Revelation, or by the time we're done with this, which could be a couple years from now, uh, so hopefully we'll remember everything that we talked about, right? Uh, but we'll have a pretty clear timeline of what's going on in that seven-year time frame. If they don't watch, if they don't pay attention to God's word, they'll have no idea what's going on when he's coming back. Right? And so I looked at a few different passages that talked about the day of visitation. Right? Jerusalem, Israel, did not know the day of visitation when Jesus came to the earth, which is such a shame because God gave them the exact year. And we looked at that, if you remember, 
I don't know, 20 weeks ago maybe? Mark's got the answer. But when we looked at the timeline of all this with Daniel 9, that prophecy, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and thy holy city, which is Israel and Jerusalem, and there will be 62 of those weeks, and then Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself. Okay, so he gave them the exact year that they should expect Messiah to come. They should have known it, but they didn't. Okay, they by and large didn't, which is really crazy when you think about it, because when Jesus was born, he really made it known. Right? The heavenly host was there saying, here he is. Right? And the shepherds went and saw, yup, that's the way it is. And they told everybody about it, and they're like, wow, that's a cool story. And apparently left it at that. Yeah, go ahead. Well, do you think it's because they maybe knew, but they didn't, the, you know, the priests didn't want to acknowledge when he was coming because they were afraid they'd have to give up their power and their control over the people? That's highly likely, yes. That's a good point. It was politically probably not good uh, in relationship to Herod. Yep. Both excellent points. Yeah, the priests at that time were probably hesitant to acknowledge that, yes, this is all true. Because, you know, you remember that when Herod was on the throne, that he made diligent search, he made the priest look, where should Messiah be born so that I can worship him? And obviously he's lying about that. But then they looked and they knew it was going to be in Bethlehem. They searched the prophets for it. So it's a good point. Yeah, they're probably having that human selfish kind of thing. Like, I don't want to give up my priesthood position, my power, my control over the people, because they did have that. Everybody had to come to them with their sacrifices and with you know, all the stuff to bring into the temple so they could intercede for them. And the other point about Herod being on the throne, you're right, uh, when he found out that someone else was born king of the Jews, we saw what he did. <laughs> and that's it, kill all the babies. <laughs> Just scary stuff, but um, man, yeah. I, I, it's that sort of thing that's been going on this whole week, which I've been flustered in my prayer life to the point of, God, I don't know what to pray. Just please help fix it. <laughs> right? Like I can't even put these things to words anymore, and I don't want to digress with all the things my eyes have been open to this week. Just really dark spiritual stuff that the world is doing and blatantly doing and not caring that it's satanic. So I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, yeah, the world is preferring it. Uh, they're promoting it. Uh, not like this is anything new, but you know, highly profiled people are saying that uh, Satan's not such a bad guy. He's just misunderstood, and so we should get to know him better. Stuff like that. Yeah, God is still sovereign despite all the absurdities that are going on in the world, and he's going to work all things out for good. Even if we can't see them right away, it does happen, both in the big events and in the little ones, ones that may not even be advertised outside of your home or your, your small circle or whatever you want to call it. Um, I, I loved sharing stories like that and just saying how God worked in that little thing in my life, but um, that's for another time. So uh, to this church at Sardis, he's, he's again telling them, hold fast and repent, because if you don't pay attention, if you don't watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Okay. So I looked at uh, Luke 19, 1 Peter 2, 2 Peter 3. All of those had something to do with the day of visitation. Like Luke 19 is the triumphal entry, and that's where he said he was lamenting over them. It's like, I wish you knew the day of your visitation. I'm here, and you're not ready. Uh, you weren't paying attention. Uh, 2 Peter 3 is... Yeah, the one I often come to that says that Peter himself acknowledges Jesus sent Paul and the reason Israel doesn't have their kingdom is because what God's doing through Paul. Yes, Second Peter 3 does say that. And also is talking to that uh, believing remnant after the body of Christ is out of here. And saying that in the last days there will come scoffers, of course, saying that all things are the same as they've ever been. You know, so we're just going to do whatever we're going to do. Uh, except that Peter is telling them that judgment's coming, and the only reason that God has put that off is to bring salvation to everybody. And that's the other side of it, I guess, is, is what is Second Peter 3. And he does mention that God will come as a thief. And every time that he's mentioned he's coming as a thief, it has that bit of context, is that people don't know it because they don't bother with the word of God. They, they reject it. They scoff at it. And by and large, the world won't know it. But we ought to be sober-minded. We have the mind of Christ. We can 
see the trends of the world, we know we're getting ever closer. Or as one of my uncles will always say if you ask him, hey, how are you doing today? One day closer to home. Now, that's his attitude, which is awesome. And we get that. And it, it's hard for us to fathom how much more off the deep end the world can get, but there's still a little more. Because we're still here. <laughs> if you've ever been robbed, ever had a thief in your home, that concept is important, coming as a thief in the night, because it's disruptive. It's completely by surprise. Mm -hmm. and, and so when it comes as a thief in the night, we have to understand that what we expect is solid ground in terms of home and life and everything is completely disrupted. A lot of people are going to feel violated by that surprise. Yeah, that's a good point, too. Go ahead. So what, uh, with something else, but what he just brought up, I had a home invasion in my house at 2 o'clock on an early Friday morning. And it's nothing like you ever would expect. Mm. However, the good side of it is this Friday is the beginning of the Feast of Trump. Oh, yes. <laughs> this Friday is the feast, begins the Feast of Trumpets. I, I never remember what day we're on. What day is it? Oh, the 18th? Yeah, next week is, is Rosh Hashanah. How exciting. So, um, yeah, something might happen. We don't know. <laughs> but uh, to the point of the thief in the night, it is disruptive. And it, it just shakes the, the normal, just puts it on edge. Right, like everything changes in that moment. I can share some thievery stories when I was at college in Madison, really obnoxious things. Um, again, we'll save that for later. <laughs> but uh, it, it's, yeah, it makes you think. Like it takes you out of that, that rut of, the, of this is what I do every day. And uh, to the point of it is disruptive, when we read in Revelation, um, the bulk of the world is going to get angry at it. Like you, you took away this. Like this is the wrath of God. Man, that's annoying. Right? It's like they're not getting the point of you should just trust him because he's coming. Uh, but it, rather, they're going to say, oh, let the rocks fall on us. I, guess, I don't want to deal with this. Which is just going to get wor even worse from there. Okay, I did want to look at a couple of different passages with the thief in the night in mind. If we look at Luke 12... And I'll start in verse 32 to get a bit of context. And just to remind us, that's the term, the little flock, where that comes from. Because Jesus is speaking unto his disciples at this point. So these are those that are positionally in Christ. In verse uh, Luke, where am I? Luke 12, 32. It says, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell that ye have, and give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Let your loins be girded about, and your lights burning. And ye yourselves, like unto men that wait for their Lord, when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. So that coming and knocking, and behold, I stand at the door. Just keep that in mind when we get to Laodicea. Uh, verse 37 says, Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. So just in case we're not aware that night was broken up into four watches and three hours each and so people would have to stay awake we didn't have alarm clocks or video surveillance or whatever you know back then so they broke it up into four watches and it doesn't matter so second or third that's the middle of the night that would be what nine to midnight midnight to three something like that uh, it doesn't matter if they are still doing what they should be doing that's what he's saying here right our blessed are those servants verse 39 and this no that if the good men of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. Then Peter said unto him, Lord, speakest thou this parable unto us, or even unto all? And the Lord said, 
Who then is that faithful and wise servant whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household to give them their portion of meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Of a truth I say unto you that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. But and if that servant say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to beat the men servants and maid servants, and to eat and to drink and to be drunken, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and at an hour he is not aware, and will cut him in sunder, and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant which knew his Lord's will, and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not, and did commit things worthy of stripes, shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much, of him will they ask, they will ask the more. So we learn a few things from this passage, and hopefully, again, we get the idea of what's happening at this church in Sardis. They had received and heard. Much was given to them. So much was expected of them. And so if they're not going to do anything about it, as we read here, they're going to get a whole bunch of stripes, right? Or, worst case scenario, they never trusted God. They're doing it all for themselves. It's all for the show. And verse 46 there has, he'll cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. All right, so there's some pretty severe consequences that Jesus warns plenty about, that uh, this church in Sardis needs to do something about it. All right, what you've received and heard, hold fast, repent. Otherwise, I'm coming as a thief. And that's exactly what we read here. If someone is ready... If the goodman in the house is prepared for it, he's not going to let that thief in. He's going to know it's coming and be ready. And so what Jesus is telling the little flock, because that's what's in context, you need to be ready. So what do we read in Peter's and James' epistles? Faith without works is dead. What manner of persons ought we to be, knowing that everything is going to be burned with fervent heat? Second Peter 3. You know, live holy. So you know, you're, let your... How's a... Matthew 5, go, let your good work shine before men so that others might see God the Father, something like that. <laughs> I can't remember it off the top of my head. So hopefully you remember the verse. Father, which is in heaven. Thank you, yes. I need more coffee this morning. Um, had a thought, now it's gone. Anyone else want to share while I get back on the track? Okay. <laughs> All right, yes. Yeah. So coming back to Revelation chapter 3 then. So these in the church of Sardis that know the word of God, they know the truth, much has been given, much is expected. They've got something to live up to at this time. And if he's saying, if you won't watch, then I'm going to come, out, come at you as a thief. So all that stuff we kind of covered last week. I'm getting a little bit into new things now. Uh, now. Verse 4, thou hast a few names even in Sardis which have not defiled their garments and they shall walk with me in white for they are worthy okay, so I just want to point out the contrast which I know even a casual reading you can see it uh, but these are going to walk with Jesus himself okay, let that moment think, sink in for a little bit because I get excited when I read any verse like that I get to be with Jesus himself someday All right, so he's telling these saints here and remember again the time frame that we're up and out of here. They got seven years to go. So all those verses that say endure unto the end for your salvation, they've got to do that. Uh, but he's saying here, you have a few names in Sardis which have not defiled their garments. Well, they would know what that means, being a Jew. And uh, obviously we can get the picture idea, I guess, in our heads too. But if we turn first to Leviticus chapter 13... Leviticus chapter 13 and verse 47. Now this specifically has to do with leprosy in a garment. But I'm just coming to the point of having a garment with blemish, with a spot, with all that stuff. Because uh, we can think and remind ourselves that anybody under the law could not bring a sacrifice that had 
blemish, <coughs> spot, wrinkle, anything like that. But when we read Leviticus 13, verse 47, specifically dealing with a garment, it says the garment also that the plague of leprosy is in, whether it be a woolen garment or a linen garment, whether it be in the warp or wolf or of linen or of woolen, whether in the skin or in anything made of the skin. I feel like i got to translate English to English for that. Uh, if, if nobody is a, um, what's even the term? A weaver? Uh, the warp and the wolf are terms of the yarns, how they are in the garment. They're either lengthwise or they're crisscrossed, something like that, I think. So that's all that means. <laughs> so if, if this leprosy is anywhere in the garment, verse 49, if the plague be greenish or reddish in the garment or in the skin, either in the warp or in the wolf or in anything of skin, it is a plague of leprosy and shall be showed unto the priest. And the priest shall look upon the plague and shut up it that hath the plague seven days. And he shall look on the plague on the seventh day. If the plague be spread in the garment, either in the warp or in the wolf or in the skin, or in any work that is made of skin, the plague is a fretting leprosy, it is unclean. He shall, therefore, burn that garment. Hmm. Whether warp of... <laughs> Warp or woof in woolen or in linen or anything of skin wherein the plague is, for it is fretting, fretting leprosy, it shall be burnt in the fire. And if the priest shall look, and behold, the plague be not spread in the garment, either warp or woof and all of that, uh, then the priest shall command that they wash the thing wherein the plague is, he shall shut it up seven days more. The priest shall look on the plague after that is washed, and behold... If the plague have not changed his color, and the plague be not spread, it is unclean. Thou shalt burn it in the fire, it is fret inward, whether it be bare within or without. And if the priest look, and behold, the plague be somewhat dark after the washing of it, then he shall rend it out of the garment, or out of the skin, or out of the warp, or out of the woof. And if it appears still in the garment, whether either in the warp, or in the woof, or in anything of skin, it is a spreading plague. Thou shalt burn that wherein the plague is with fire. And the garment, either warp or woof, or whatsoever thing of the skin it be, which thou shalt wash, if the plague be departed from them, then it shall be washed a second time and shall be clean. This is the law of the plague of leprosy in a garment of woolen or linen, either in the warp or woof or in anything of skins, to pronounce it clean or unclean. Whew, that's a mouthful. <laughs> There were rules on your clothes under the law. But why do I bother coming here again? Because Jesus specifically mentioned that there are those in Sardis which have not defiled their garments. What essentially did they do with the defiled garments? Cast in the fire. It was burned. Okay? There's some symbolism I think we can pick up here with that. And the, again, the contrast is that these in Sardis that have not defiled their garments, they shall walk, shall walk. So again, that's future tense. Endure to the end for that salvation. Okay, they shall walk with me in white. So instead of having defiled garments, they have a pure white garment. And what we just read, too, after it's washed and washed, it was clean. You can wear it. It's fine. It's good. All right, and again, there's that picture there, but if we want a nice straightforward answer... Uh, we turn to Revelation 19, which defines the white raiment or the white clothing. Revelation 19 and verse... Oh, man. I guess verse 7. Revelation 19, 7 says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And that's the whole point of coming here. But I had in my notes to go over more. All the way to verse 14. Okay, we can do that. All right, it says, verse 9, And he uh, saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. 
worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Which we just read was the righteousness of the saints. Okay, so when Jesus himself says to those in Sardis that there are those that have not defiled their garments, they shall walk with me in white, we get an idea of what he's talking about. They're going to enjoy that earthly kingdom. They're going to enjoy that salvation, that resurrection, the first resurrection. All that, man, I always think of a game show when I think of this. All that can be yours and more, uh, <laughs> which is really what it is, right? I've held that one in for a few weeks, but um, out it comes. All of that is what they have to look forward to, and yes, more. Uh, when they experience life in the person of Jesus Christ himself, the waters, uh, the living waters flowing from his throne, it's going to be awesome. Coming back to Revelation 3, though, we get more of a picture of this letter to the church in Sardis. You guys have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. You're hardly doing anything right, so you'd better strengthen those right things. And if you don't pay attention, that coming that we just read, when Jesus Christ appears in the heavens with the heavenly host coming down with judgment and war, that's going to be the thief in the night scenario. Whoa, didn't see that one coming. Whereas compared to those that... Uh, did not defile their garments like yes finally because <laughs> they they may not know the day or the hour like you know we read so often about or so often quoted but they'll know really close they'll know the season and they'll be looking up right look up for your redemption draw off nine that's what they're told to do it, whether it's the second or the third watch and we can only imagine if those that are paying attention like daniel remember he read in the books like he read through jeremiah it's like oh those 70 years they're up Awesome, And so he starts praying and confessing the sins of Israel to God. And that's where we get the Daniel 9 prophecy. But he knew what was happening. We're, we're all done with this captivity. As far as he knew. But then the 490 year thing. But similarly, these saints that are going through the tribulation period, they're going to recognize, hey, that was the body of Christ out of here. Here's the covenant that was made. We got seven years from there. Now, they'll know really close to when he's coming. And they'll look up and rejoice at that time. I think we can finish Sardis yet. No, we can't, because i got to talk about the book of life. Uh, Revelation 3.5 says, He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. Okay? So coupling that with verse 4, uh, they'll walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Uh, they'll be clothed in white raiment. They shall be clothed in white raiment. We get the idea, hopefully now, what that's really getting at. Oh, I don't think I can do this justice in 10 minutes. But it does say here, I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Before I start down that path, anyone have any comments, thoughts, questions? Eternal security comes to mind. Eternal security comes to mind. They'll, yeah, positionally, those that trust in Christ will still be in Christ, right? We'll get to the book of life. Okay, let's see how far we can get here. I catch up on my notes down there. Okay, so just looking at this again, Revelation 3, 5, when it says that he that overcometh. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Overcomes what? Every time we've read through these letters in the book of Revelation, it ends with, he that overcometh. But I would like to ask the question, overcome what? Because this is directed specifically to that church, or I guess if you want to broaden the horizons here, because it was meant to be circulated, the churches that are dealing with that exact issue. Right? Those that are overcome, they need to overcome that concept of living but are dead, or exhibiting that they are some spiritual religious entity or something like that, or that like showing that they're alive, but really it's not. Right? And, and we, we 
I guess I, mentioned that it's like the social gospel or prosperity gospel or whatever other gospels, and I'm air quoting that, are out there trying to promote something that's just not biblical. Right? But it sounds good, it looks good, and it tickles the ears that those that want to hear it, and so people flock to those churches, and many mega churches are like that, I'm not going to say all of them, but in reality, the truth isn't popular. Uh, the, uh, the human heart doesn't want to acknowledge that there is one true God. The human heart wants to be God. And that going all the way back to Genesis 3, that, uh, the lie that Satan posed. You could be just like God, uh, just like Elohim, uh, is the Hebrew word there. So he that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white. If you stay the course, right, endure to the end, overcome that, uh, then they have that expected end, which is that first resurrection uh, and in Revelation 20. But then it says in Revelation 3, 5, uh, I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. And it's really interesting that God words it that way. I will not blot it out. What does that imply? The name was already there. Okay? And I'll just give this a broad statement because I've got just five minutes. We'll look at at least one passage. But it seems to me as I read through these verses that have to do with the book of life that everyone that hath... There's King James coming out of me. Everyone that has breath and life, their names are written there. But how they conduct themselves, and in other words, really, where their heart is at, determines whether or not that name is blotted out or it remains. Okay, so let's turn first to Psalm 69. Psalm 69 and verse 16. Just to give a little bit of context. Psalm chapter 69 and verse 16. It says, Hear me, O Lord, for thy loving kindness is good. Turn unto me according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, and hide not thy face from thy servant, for I am in trouble. Hear me speedily. Draw nigh unto my soul, and redeem it. Deliver me because of mine enemies. Thou hast known my reproach and my shame and my dishonor. Mine adversaries are all before thee. Reproach hath broken my heart, and I am full of heaviness. And I looked for some to take pity, but there was none. And for comforters, but I found none. They also gave me gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Hopefully that triggers some memories. Let their table become a snare before them, and that which should have been for their welfare, let it become a trap. Let their eyes be darkened that they see not, and make their loins continually to shake. Pour out thine indignation upon them, and let thy wrathful anger take hold of them. Let their habitation be desolate, and let none dwell in their tents. For they persecute him whom thou hast smitten. And they talk to the grief of those whom thou hast wounded. Add iniquity unto their iniquity, and let them not come into thy righteousness. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living, and not be written with the righteous. Now before I even move, well, no, that's enough. Let them, who's the them here? Right, because I like to say follow the pronouns. Sorry, I interrupted you. Well, who's the them? <laughs> Yeah, Saul and company, sure. Persecutors, it's all those unbelievers that are after Christ, right? They're against him, or we could even term it anti-Christ, right? Opposed to Christ. So that's the them, and what is he saying? Let those names be blotted out of the book of the living. Again, what does that imply if he's going to blot them out? Names are already there. Right? And that it's, when I read stuff like this, that's why I said before, anybody that has breath in life, anyone that God put together in their mother's womb, right? he breathes into them the breath of life, it's a human soul, right? They're in the book of life because they have life. But how they choose to, uh, or answer that question that Pilate poses, what then shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? 
Because everyone has to reconcile that at some point in their lives. What am I going to do about that? Am I going to trust that he died for me, for all my sins? He was resurrected for my justification, that he paid for my sin in full by his blood. I'm complete in Christ, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> right? Do I believe all of that or not? Is it more you just die and then you're done? Or Satan's not really such a bad guy. He's just misunderstood. What about the uh, end of verse 28? And not be written with the, written with the righteous. It seems like a contrast of being blotted out and being written with the righteous. Yeah, that's true. Uh, there's a contrast there of the those that are persecuting Christ or against Christ, let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. So in, whether that's another book or not, I think it would be that same book of life, and that is where all the righteous are, uh, because they will inherit eternal life with their Lord and Savior. And the unrighteous are the ones that will be not in this book of life anymore. They will have death. Right? The second death awaits them, yeah. They have to be righteous to dwell with God because he's so righteous, he can't even look on unrighteousness. Yeah, yep. We have to be righteous to even live with God. We cannot be in his presence without it. No human can, yeah. So I'm going to offer an alternative viewpoint on this. Sure. Um, I, I think the Book of Life is peculiar, peculiarly uh, Hebrew. I think... To be born into the Hebrew nation is to be born into that book, and they are the ones that can be removed from it. Um, and when I said that Saul and company, I'm not the sort of the immediate application of the psalm, and that it's a psalm of David. Yeah. He's being persecuted by King Saul and those that band with him. Um, and, you know, the, the book of Revelation finishes out with this notion about whether or not you're kept in that book or out of it. But I think it, it correlates with Numbers 15 that talks about the sin of presumption in Israel, um, and that starts maybe at around verse 29. You shall have one law for him that sinneth through ignorance, or for him that is born among the children of Israel, and for the stranger that sojourneth among them. The soul that doth aught presumptuously, whether he be born in the land or stranger, the same reproaches the Lord, and that soul shall be cut off from among the people, because he hath despised the word of the Lord. And, you know, there's a... Uh, an account of the uh, Sabbath breaking that comes up in there where they, they have to determine to stone a man to death. Mm -hmm. So there were things that you could do uh, as a Hebrew to get yourself cut off from the people entirely. And you know, it seems to me that that's what this notion of book of life relates to. Yeah, that's excellent. Uh, bringing up numbers 15, 29, and 30, and probably more for more context. But yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, if they transgressed the law, that they were cut off from the people, doing it presumptuously, so they're willingly going against God's word, willingly ignorant, like it says in Second Peter, yeah. They're choosing to ignore it, reject it, that they'll be cut off from the people. They won't enjoy that rest, right? So the book of Hebrews talks a lot about entering into God's rest. So yeah, I think that all goes along with it. I will do one more comment and... We'll have to pick it up here next week. My confusion is, um, I mean, I, I, I see both sides of it, but those that are coming through the tribulation, it's not just the Hebrew people, it's also, it's Jews and Gentiles to simplify it. So then if that's the case, then the Gentiles would be written in the Book of Life also. Yep, and you guys are bringing up great points, so let me bring us to Philippians 4. We'll actually end it there, even though I hadn't planned to get here yet, but time being what it is. Uh, Philippians 4 and verse 1. Because <clears throat> even in the book of Numbers, it also includes that he that sojourneth among you, which would be any Gentiles that had proselytized at that time. Uh, chapter 4 of Philippians says there, we know who wrote this, we know who it's to, right? Uh, Paul, of course, the body of Christ is who it's written to. So verse 4, no, sorry, chapter 4, verse 1 
It says, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and longed for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. And I beseech Eodius and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other of my fellow laborers whose names are where? The Book of Life. Yeah. So it's, it's really interesting that Paul would write about stuff like that here too in the Philippians, in the letter to the Philippians. So I think it encompasses all believers, uh, this book of life, yeah? He had Jewish people who helped him too. Yes, he did. That could be the fellow that he's talking about. Okay, yep. They could be fellow laborers, could be referring to Jews with him. Okay. And in either respect, Paul is speaking to the gospel of mystery, and we had previous, uh, previous uh, examples of it that are strictly Jewish. So it looks like it's more one than not, you know, than separate. Than separated? Well, it's certainly something to noodle on for the week. <laughs> so to get to the point of if that's the case, then that means none of the Gentiles will be saved during tribulation? Well, they would... See, I mean, do you see where my confusion comes in? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, saved uh, prior to the gospel yeah, they of they come through Israel. They, yep. they come through Israel. Yeah. Yep. They had to obey God's commandments at that time, which would be to trust him at his word, that he was sending Messiah, and then to do all the works of the law. So faith plus works at that point. Excellent discussion. I really wish we had like another hour uh, to go over this stuff. But we'll, we'll start more, talk more about the book of life next week. Uh, let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for this time and thank you, Lord, for the edifying discussion. I'm so thankful, Lord, that we are of the mindset to encourage one another and to glorify you in, uh, uh, in all things, that we search diligently for the truth and pray that you continue to fill us by your spirit with your wisdom uh, that we can understand and eliminate confusion, stand boldly uh, upon your holy word, which we know to be true, and share this gospel while it is still called today. Uh, Lord, we look forward to that day where you do call us up and out of here. Uh, until then, may we stand strong in you and your might, uh, wearing that full armor of God. Uh, in Christ's name I pray. Amen. <laughs>